Jesus looks at you, you know what he sees? He sees potential. He sees awesome potential. I want you guys to be people that expect to see God move. I want you to expect God to use you. Because what you carry inside of you has the limitless power of God behind it. The only limits in your life are the ones that you accept yourself because God is limitless. Isn't that right? God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the call. I am going to be sharing a little bit for a while with you guys. You may well know already. My name is Laura. Um, I come from uh, the Midlands. <laughs> Clearly, the best place ever. Woo! -hoo! Yes. Uh, I currently live in Hales Owen near Birmingham. Yes. Um, I have a lovely husband who is here. I have a wonderful dog. I'm a part of Zion Christian Center. I work for uh, Youth for Christ. That's what I do in my everyday. But I get to hang out with you guys. I get to do really loads of cool stuff. And this afternoon, before we go home, the very last thing that I want to talk to you guys about is living in a limitless reality. So um, there are going to be some slides that come up as we, as we talk. I like this because it reminds me of unicorns. Uh, I don't know why. I just feel like a unicorn will fit on that slide. Um, and we're going to talk about what it means to live in a re limitless reality as you go home. So as we think, we begin to think about maybe the start of half term or for some of us going back to school, what does it mean for you to live in a limitless reality in those spaces, in your schools, in your homes, in your church, in your activity groups, online? What does it mean to take some of the presence of God that we just saw in this space, some of that reality into the reality that you are experiencing and living in at home? So that's what we're going to spend some time looking at. Now, there's going to be a phrase I'm going to be using throughout this talk. And I just want to talk to you about this phrase before I talk about it, if that makes sense, just to make sure that we're tracking together and you understand. So this, if, if it could come up on the, on the slide, that would be wonderful. This, will, this is the phrase that we're going to keep talking about. What you see determines your reality, and your reality determines your response. If we could keep that slide up for a little while, that would be brilliant. What you see determines your reality, and your reality determines your response. Now, I found it really exciting uh, when this morning we were talking about what it means to see. Because here, when, when I'm talking about what, how you see your reality, what I mean is how you perceive your reality, how you view the reality and the world around you. Not necessarily what you see with your eyes, but what's happening in the under unseen. And so what we're talking about is how you view what is happening in the unseen will determine the reality that you live in and what you believe about the world around you. And that, therefore, will determine your response. Wow. You thought we were going to have it light this afternoon, didn't you? Not a chance. Okay. So, um, we're going to do this by, first of all, I'm going to, I'm going to make sure that we, we, we get this. Then we're going to look at what it means for you to see, to really see the unseen around you. And then we're going to look at reality. What does reality mean around us? How do I see reality? And I want to try and help you very worryingly try and work out what reality means, but the way I see it, which is the scary part. And then what does that mean for your response? What does that mean for transformed communities, for your school, for the lives of your friends to be transformed? Is that okay? Is that okay? Wow, I think you guys are tired, but we're going to be cool. We're going to be good. Right. First of all, I want to just make sure that we understand what this phrase means. Could I have um, the next picture up, please? Uh, the next one. That's great. This... No, no, go back. Go back. Ah, go back, go back, go back, go back. Thank you. This is me water skiing. Okay. So um, I, I, um, I don't really do water sports. I don't really water ski, but this is me water skiing. I was so proud of this moment. This is the third time. Has anyone here been water skiing before? Just me. Wow. Silence. This is my third time water skiing. And I got up on the skis. I mean, there was a lot of time spent on my face, like hitting the face and the water together. But this, this was my third time ever water skiing. Um, and I don't really do water sports um, because I don't like fish. Just hold off on that, that next picture. But I really don't like fish. Um, 
Tim said earlier on um, yesterday that one thing I don't like is beards. I really don't like beards. I don't like beards that move on their own. If a beard can move independently of the face in the wind, it's just too long. But as much as I don't like beards, I like fish even less. I really, I can't expect their eyes. I don't trust their eyes or their little fins. I don't like that they move quicker than me. There's a lot about fish that I don't trust. And um, when I first went water skiing, the reason I don't do water sports is because I don't really like fish. And the first time I went water skiing, it was in an ocean. And so I thought, well, I've heard that there's less and less fish. They're kind of dying out, we're eating them all. And I've heard that water levels are rising, which must mean in fish per inch, per square inch in the ocean, my chances now are greater than they have ever been of getting away with not touching a fish. So I thought, well, I'll go water skiing because in the ocean, surely they'll be nowhere near me. So I went water skiing, I went twice in the ocean and that built up my confidence. And so my friend said to me, well, why don't you come water skiing with us? I was like, okay. So I got to this lake and Andy, my husband, came with us. And because I'd become so confident in the lack of fish that I had encountered in the ocean, I got to this massive lake and thought, well, I've done well before, haven't I? And why would I presume that there are fish in every lake? Maybe this is one of those fish-free lakes that you don't really hear about, but why would you hear about it? It's probably a fish-free lake, I'll be fine. So I got on my water skis, I went around the... the like, and I fell in a few times, loads of times, I fell in loads of times, and the worst thing that happened was that I got covered in this, like, it was grim, like, covered in this, like, pond weed, which was disgusting, and um, I went water skiing, I came home, it was all fine, until a couple of weeks later, I was sat at my desk, and opposite me is a guy called Dan, who goes, who has been to this lake a few times, and um, Dan said to me, no way, you went to that lake, that is so cool, did you meet Bob? I was like, oh, Bob. No, no, I don't think I did. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking about the people that were helping me. They weren't Bob. The people I met weren't Bob. And then I thought, boats? Could boats be Bob? I thought about the boats. None of the boats were Bob. I was like, no, I didn't, I didn't meet Bob. He's like, oh, do you know what Bob is? I was like, no. He's like, oh, he's a massive pike that lives in that lake. This is, the, this is, this is a pike. This, this was in that water, right? Not this, it wasn't that big. I have over-dramatized this a little. But this kind of fish was in that water and I was skiing around all oblivious until I found out that that lived in there. And apparently it's massive and it's called Bob, but it's okay, it's only in the deep bits, which actually is where you go to water ski. It was horrendous. You see, when I'd learned about water skiing, when I was there, when I was going around, when I thought about myself on this lake, my reality was that there was no fish in this lake because that is what I could see. I couldn't see what was under the water, so I was absolutely fine. So my reality was, and my response was, that I was perfectly happy to water ski. However, if I'd have known the actual reality, if I'd have known what was going on in the unseen, underneath the water, then my response would have been completely different. Now I'm not so keen on water skiing there anymore because the reality is based on what you see and what you know. Uh, do you know, I think so often we um, go home and we go uh, back to our communities, back to our schools, and we are so caught up in what we see. We're so kind of busy being confronted with the everyday, with maths, with science, with college, with work, with clubs, that we totally forget that God is operating in the unseen in those areas. Do you know that while you're sat here right now, God is doing stuff in the life of your friends at home? That God is doing stuff in your people in your class. People is doing, um, God is doing stuff in your family right now. As you're sat here, God is doing stuff in the unseen. But so often we don't train ourselves to see it. Do you know there's an amazing verse in the Bible? In 2 Corinthians 4 verse 18, it says, So we don't look at the troubles that we see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone. But the things we cannot see will last forever. Do you know our reality should be based on who our God is? And our God is a limitless God. It says that in Psalms, it actually describes him as that. So we're gonna spend a few minutes looking at what it is to be and operate in the unseen, to walk into a space and go, God, what is it you're doing here? 
and looking out for that reality that is actually greater than the reality we see in front of us. Okay, so we're going to have a read uh, of a, a little few verses in the Bible from 2 Kings 6. Now, I like 2 Kings 6. It's got two of my favorite stories in. It's pretty strong. So this story is um, about a guy called Elisha. And uh, this is what it says. Ahem. When the king of Aram, now he, he is the baddie in this story, uh, when the king of Aram was at war with Israel, he would confer with his officials and say, we will mobilize our forces at such and such a place. But immediately Elisha, the man of God, would warn the king of Israel, don't go near that place, for the Arameans are planning to mobilize their troops there. So the king of Israel would send word to the place indicated by the man of God. Time and time again, Elisha warned the king so that he would be on the alert there. The king of Aram became very upset over this. He called his officials together and demanded, which of you is the traitor? Who has been informing the king of Israel of my plans? It's not us, my lord, the king, one of the officers replied. Elisha the prophet said, um, Elisha the prophet in Israel tells the king of Israel, even the words that you speak in the privacy of your bedroom. Go and find out where he is, the king commanded, so I can send my troops to seize him. The report came back, Elisha is at Dothan. So that night, the king of Aram sent a great army with many chariots and horses to surround the city. Now, what makes me laugh about this story is that this guy's problem is that he sends out his chariots and his horses. Elisha is told by God exactly where they're going, and this king's plans are scuppered. The way he thinks he's going to solve the problem is by sending those same chariots and horses to sort it out. I really don't understand his logic, but it turned out okay in the end. Okay, so here we are. Um, he's in Dothan. So, send his horses to surround the city. When the servant of the man of God, so this is the servant of Elisha, got up early the next morning and went outside, there were troops, horses, and chariots everywhere. Oh, sir, what will we do now? The young man cried to Elisha. Don't be afraid, Elisha told him, for there are more on our side than, there, than on theirs. Then Elisha prayed, O oh Lord, open his eyes and let him see. The Lord opened the young man's eyes, and when he looked up, he saw the hillside around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire. I love this story, because this is about a guy who is confronted with the normal, confronted with the everyday, confronted with the stuff in front of him that actually is really terrifying. Maybe the equivalent of you going back home and starting up a CU in your school. Maybe the equivalent of you going home and praying for one of your friends to be healed. Confronted with something that absolutely should have terrified him. However, in this story, there are two responses. There's the response of Elisha and there's the response of his servant. You see, Elisha sees the unseen. He understands that in any situation that you walk into, God is doing something in that space. And so rather than looking at what's in front of him and going, oh my gosh, this is awful, he asks the question, God, what are you doing here? And what God does is he shows him these armies of horses and chariots of fire that have got his back. However, there's his servant's perspective. And his servant gets caught up in the everyday. His servant gets caught up in what's in front of him right now, the demands that are right in front of his face. Maybe the equivalent for us is our homework, our revision, that um, gossip that our friend has been telling us, the stuff that our mates are trying to get us to do, uh, all that's coming up on our phone and social media, all of that stuff. He gets caught up in that. And his response, his response is fear. And what were we told earlier? That fear stands for false evidence appearing real. His reality is skewed because of his fear, and he misses what's actually going on. He gets so caught up in the everyday that he misses what God is doing in that space. Guys, I don't want you guys to be like that. Don't miss what God is doing. Okay, um, I want to play a game very, very quickly. Um, um, can I firstly, this is a counting game, so Dave Grogan has to be one of the people to participate if he's in the room. Is Dave in here? No. Is one of his youth group in here? Could one of you guys come up? So can I have one of, one of his youth group up here? Is that okay? Great. You can pick who comes. Okay, can I have two more volunteers? Uh, yeah, go with the bag. Bag here? Yeah, 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 yeah. In the grey. And guy, guy in the blue. Yeah, can you, yes, 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 yes. Can you come up? Right. Uh, so what I need you to do... Where's the third person? 
No, no, no. Someone from Dave's youth group. Are they coming? Is this Sam? Great. Can you, can you come up there quick? Is that all right? Have a little jog. Yes, there we go. Little jog. The reason I wanted... It's, it's Sam, right? Michael. I thought you said Sam. I'm so sorry. This is Michael. Say hi, Michael. Hi. So these guys, their talent was counting. So I'm pretty excited about Michael taking part in this game. What's your name? Sam. Sa this Sam? I found Sam. Fantastic. Thank you, Sam. Great. And what's your name? Josie. 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 Great. Fantastic. Right. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to ask you guys to turn around and face me. You stay, so stay down there and face me. And in a second, I'm going to ask you guys to sit on the floor. And what you need to try and do is count to 60. Okay. So you need to try and count to a minute. And when you think it's a minute, I want you to stand up. And the person who stands up closest to a minute will win one of Ben's CDs. Is that okay? Yeah? Right. So what I need you to do, you guys count. By all means, count. I don't want you to give them any clues as to when it's a minute. Is that okay? Is that all right? Great. So uh, if you guys sit on the floor, I'm going to tell you when I'm going to start the stopwatch. Um, and I will come back here. I just don't want you facing that way in case anyone's like, yeah, it's a minute. Right. So um, are, you clear? are you clear on what you need to do? Everyone understands. Fantastic. Okay. So you need to count to 60. I'm going to start my stopwatch in three, two, one, go. We'll just have a nice time. I think that's for Rich. You guys are so weird. Okay. Okay, 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 okay. Okay, okay, okay. Turn around, turn around, turn around. Right, so, Mike, you stood up first. All done. Very brave of you. You stood up at about 50 seconds. JC, you stood up about one minute three, which means, Sam, you stood up at 59 seconds, which makes you our winner. Well done. Well done. Round of applause for everybody. Well done, Sam. Professional counters. You see, I think if it had been up to five, then Dave's group would have probably done very, very well. It was probably the 60 that made them struggle. Very well done. Great. Fantastic. So, how many of you tried to count to 60 in that moment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I always try, I try and do it. I try and see if I can do it. And in that moment, all that I do, and all these guys were doing, I could see Sam sat here, and as soon as I pressed it, he went, Three. And you start counting. And in my head, I'm going, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi. And I'm just trying to get it right. And I spend an entire minute waiting to get to 60. And nothing else in that moment. They weren't distracted. They weren't distracted by your whistling. They weren't distracted by your shouting. In that minute, nothing would take their eyes off of that 60. Now, what happens, however, is in, in life, when you get home, when we try to have these encounters with God's reality and what God is doing, is that we keep looking at 60. What I mean by that is we have events where we expect to encounter God's reality, to encounter God's spirit doing stuff, to kind of meet with God's presence, places like here. And so we come to the gathering and we go, yeah, I've experienced God, wicked, I'm going to go home. And then we go, right, what's the next thing? Okay, well, we've got that, that youth event, or we've got that, that weekend away, or maybe there's a summer camp or the next gathering. And so we spend our whole time focused on the next thing, focused on the next 60. But do you know what happens when we try to go from mountaintop to mountaintop? Is that we miss all the bits in between. You see, we're so expectant of God meeting us in this space, which is totally right, that we miss what he does in all the days in between. 
We have our eyes so focused on the big event as to where we're going to see God move that we miss him in the days. Do you know every day God has something for you to do in your world? Every day he has someone for you to speak to or wants to kind of talk to you about something and meet with you. And yet we're so determined that God's going to meet with us at these big events that we miss the days. Just as Elisha's servant totally missed what God was doing in that. You see, what happens is you don't, when you, when you wait for the, for the events, that you don't begin to look in the days. You don't expect God to move and so you miss it. Because what you see determines your reality, and your reality determines your response. If your perspective, if your view is that God only moves in this sort of space, then your reality and how you perceive reality will determine that. And it will mean that your response is that you don't see God move in the everyday, because you just weren't looking for him. Okay, so I want to move on to reality now. I'm going to try and explain to you how I see reality. Now, I'm not saying that this is theologically watertight. I'm just going to give it a go. Uh, but however, to do this, I need to come out here. Is that okay? I'm just going to try and move into this space. I also have massive shoes on, so I'm going to try not to tread on anyone. Fantastic. Ah, uh, can I come here? Just a second. Where am I right now? Okay, 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 okay. okay. Right. So I'm with you. Now, I want you to imagine something. I want you to imagine that the space that you're, it's very warm here, the space that you're currently in is the space at the beginning of time. Okay, just stretch your imagination. So this space that we are currently in is like space and existence before the world began. This is a space where God exists. This is a space where Jesus, the Holy Spirit, God the Father is intertwined in relationship, working together. This is a limitless space full of beauty and energy. It's full of power. It's a powerful space. It's an incredible space. It's a space of perfection, a space of eternity, a space where there are no limits. And because God is a God of love within that space, he is in relationship with himself in the, in the Trinity. So the Holy Spirit, Jesus, God the Father are talking to each other. By the way, this is quite complicated, so just ask your youth leaders about the Trinity later. Um, and in this space, God begins to talk and say, I'm going to create. I'm going to create someone, something, a being that I can be in relationship with. And so God begins to create a space. Now, you guys are going to hate me. Could I just ask you to create a little circle around me? I know you don't have a lot of space. I know. I'm so sorry. If you could maybe wriggle backwards. I just want a little area, if possible. Could you shuffle backwards a little bit? I just don't want to tread on you. Fantastic. I have myself a small circle. Thank you so much. I realize how annoying I'm being, and I'm very grateful. Okay, so God creates a space within this limitless reality, and in this space here is where we exist. And God had to create a space in the limitless that was limited. And so this circle that I'm stood in is a limited space because we had to grow and develop in it. You know, if you might not know, if you're growing plants, you put them in a greenhouse, you put them in a safe, limited space in order for things to grow healthily. And so in this space, in creation, there were laws. There are laws like gravity that need to be obeyed. There's the law of thermodynamics. There's laws around density, there's life, there's death, there's things and ways that things happen in this space. It's a limited space. But we were created in this limited space as limited people. I am only capable of so much on my own. And God put us in this space to live and exist and have relationship with him. But we messed it up. Because as humans, so often that is what we do. And so we got things wrong. And Jesus and the Holy Spirit and God the Father in the purest form in this space where you are, Jesus said the only way that this can be put right is by the limitless stepping into the limited and putting things right. So Jesus comes into this space as a person, but what's interesting is that Jesus belongs in the limitless space. And so this space out here begins to invade this space here. And that's why we see Jesus do miracles and incredible things, because the laws that are in this limited space couldn't contain Jesus who came from a limitless reality. 
He came into this space and turned water into wine, walked on water, saw people healed, the blind could see, the dead came back to life because the limited space can't contain the limitless, which is why when Jesus was killed, he could not stay dead because the limitless cannot be contained by the limited. And so Jesus was killed and came back to life. And then after that, he promised that he'd leave his Holy Spirit with us. And so the Holy Spirit begins to fill this space. And Jesus says to you, you will do the same and greater works than me in this space. And so Jesus says, let me live in your heart. Let me be a part of your life. Let my Holy Spirit fill your life. And as that happens, individual followers of God begin, begin to contain and carry the limitless in this limited space. And the limitless begins to permeate the limited. And we more and more begin to see laws that should make sense in this space broken. Things are changed, people are healed, lives are transformed, stuff begins to happen that science can't possibly explain because the limited space can't contain the limitless. Do you know that you are a portal for the limitless in your school? That as you walk through your school, along your streets, you sit on your bus, you are a space where the limitless invades the limited. You carry that. That is your reality. That when you go about your day to day, when you're confronted with the really normal stuff of life, you have the same limitless power that created the earth inside of you in this limitless space. That is the reality that you carry. Okay. So, can you turn to each other for 10, 20 seconds? What would you do if someone just came and punched you in the face? Right, if someone came and just punched you in the face, what would you do? Thank you. Okay. Okay, 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 bring it back, bring it back. Bring it all back to bring it all back now. Don't stop falling in love. Na, 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 na. Yeah, that got your attention. Right. Imagine someone comes and just punches you in the face. What would you do? Come on, Ezekiel, quicker than this. You'd kick them and then hit them. Someone else would punch them in the face. I heard that. Yeah, what would you do? Fight back. One more. Good. Someone would ask them why they did it. A nice, sensible response. Well done. Okay. <laughs> As I was walking through, well, I wouldn't let anyone hit me in the face. Right. Okay. Okay. You can't kill them. Come on now. Gosh. There's some stuff that needs addressing here, people. Youth leaders, take notes. There are some angry young people in this venue. Right. Okay. So, what you see around you determines your reality. If you believe that God is doing the unseen around you, that will change how you see what is happening around you. And when you see what is happening around you differently, that determines the response that you have in a situation. Okay, so I asked you the question, what would you do if someone punched you in the face? Now, the king of um, Aram, as in, in this story, had basically been trying to kill this nation for like ages. Um, and I want to read you the response. So this is a bigger deal than being punched in the face. I want to read you the response of Elisha in this situation. So I want to take you back. You're in a situation. There are chariots all around you. Lots of people look for you to kill you. God said, oh, look at the unseen. And then there's chariots of fire everywhere. And then this is what Elisha decides to do. So. Uh, oh Lord, look, there's a hillside. And Elisha was filled with horse. Elisha was filled with horses. He saw that the hillside around Elisha. Always read the sentence before. Uh, was filled with horses and chariots of fire. Okay, here we go. As the Armenian army advanced towards him, so Elisha prayed, "O oh Lord, please make them blind." So the Lord struck them with blindness, as Elisha had asked. 
Then Elisha went out and told them, you have come the wrong way. This isn't the right city. Follow me and I will take you to the man that you're looking for. And he led them to the city of Samaria. So Elisha, not, he doesn't even hide. He just goes up to them. doesn't even put on a, like, a fake beard or anything. Just goes straight up to him and says, follow me. So he led them to the city of Samaria. As soon as they had entered Samaria, Elisha prayed, Oh Lord, now open their eyes and let them see. So the Lord opened their eyes and they discovered that they were in the middle of Samaria. Now, when the king of Israel saw them, he shouted to Elisha, My father, should I kill them? Should I kill them? Some of you suggested that, just pointing it out. Of course not, Elisha replied. Do we kill prisoners of war, give them food and drink, and send them home to their master? So the king made a great feast for them and then sent them home to their master. After that, the Aramean raiders stayed away from the land of Israel. Do you know what? This guy wanted to kill them. He wanted to kill these people because... They'd hurt them. They caused them pain. They tried to kill them. And so the, Is- the Israelite um, king was like, well, we've got them. Let's just kill them. But Elisha said, no. No. You see, I saw a different reality, and I'm going to let that reality determine my response. Do you know when you live in a reality that God is a limitless God, that God, this limitless God is at work in your school, that you carry the limitless inside of you that has to determine your response to situations? You see, as followers of Jesus, we don't act like everybody else. We are not the same as everybody else. We don't go out with people like other people go out with people. We don't go from one relationship to another relationship to another relationship to another relationship because we understand that people matter and we understand that God cares about our hearts. When people get angry with us and we get angry with people, we don't stay angry at them, but we forgive them as quickly as we got angry because we understand that forgiveness sets us free. When we have finance, when we have pocket money, when we have... um, a money that is given to us by our families or our parents, we give that money away because we understand that it was given to us by God in the first place. When we are thinking, when we're walking around, our headspace shouldn't look the same as other people's because when we're walking around, this is an opportunity for God to speak to you, for God to tell you what's going on in that space. The things we watch are different to other people. The way we speak about who we are is different to other people because we're desperate to tell them about Jesus. I want to ask you a question before I finish. Do you expect God to do something incredible in your reality at home? Like, do you expect it? Because if you don't expect it, you're not looking out for it, and therefore it will never happen. No, it never happen. It's less likely to happen. You see, if we understand that God is a limitless and powerful God, that God is perfectly capable of healing people in your schools, of all your friends becoming Christians, of seeing a move in this nation, when we understand that that is possible for God and he wants to use us to do it, then actually at that point, our expectation shifts and change. We walk into school every day and we walk into a space and we go, God, what do you want to do here? Do you know I have a challenge for you? It's something that I've started to try and do. When I walk into a new space, whether that be church, whether that be a a, Ikea, I walk into a space and I go, God, what are you doing in this space? And I wait and I see if God answers. And I want to challenge you to up your expectation. I want you guys to be people that expect to see God move. I want you to expect God to use you. Because what you carry inside of you has the limitless power of God behind it. I want you to be able to go up to people and offer to pray for them in your school. I want you to be able to go up to people and say, do you know what? I was just wondering, when I looked at you, God just gave me this feeling that, and how do you do that? How do you begin to be people that see the limitless break into your homes, break into your communities, have the courage to invite your friends to church and and bring them to know Jesus? Do you know what it takes? I think it takes five seconds of outrageous courage. And that's it. It takes enough courage to to have five seconds where you walk across the room to start a conversation with someone. Five minutes of insane bravery where you go, well, can I tell you about what I believe? Five minutes, five minutes, five seconds of insane bravery where you say, can I pray for you? Five seconds of insane bravery where in a room like this, you're prepared to stand up. And in those five seconds, lives can be transformed, including your own, because you begin to see God do incredible things. In the prayer meeting before this, um, Christian who leads worship said this incredible line. 
but the awesome is often on the other side of the awkward. Are we prepared to step out into this limitless reality, to put ourselves out there, to have five seconds of outrageous bravery and courage that we might see our homes, our churches, our schools, our communities transformed? That that friend that you love so much but doesn't know Jesus will come to know them. So um, the last thing I'm going to say is this, and we're going to finish. The thing that gives me insane five seconds of bravery shots is this. That my reality is different because I understand that the moment that I accepted Jesus into my life, Jesus lives in me. And what that means is that limitless Jesus, who I talked about in the middle of the room, means that just as Jesus couldn't be contained and death couldn't hold him, now that's true of me. Do you know that the moment that you said yes to Jesus, you began living for eternity? I mean, it's likely you'll die unless Jesus comes back, but you are living for eternity. And when you live for eternity, you can't help but your perspective be different.